Um, hello, my name is Chris Foster. Um, thank you so much to the Han Phenology Project for having me here. Um, I'm something of an interloper. I, uh, I'm not a linguist. Um, I'm interested in linguistics, as, as we'll see, obviously. Um, I'm also not going to be presenting on graph or network theory. Um, also something I'm interested in. I'm at SOAS uh, in London. I'm working on medieval Buddhist glossaries, and I'm interested in the uh, relationship of citation practices. So I do want to do something with network theory, uh, but more in terms of within a gloss, how are different reference works related to one another and why? Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming in from that angle. But my first love uh, has been reading these uh, newly discovered excavated manuscripts, um, dating from the Han period and a little bit earlier, written on wood and bamboo. Um, and that's where I get into linguistics, because I'm really interested in, okay, how can we reconstruct the pronunciation of these old words, and how does that then inform us in terms of reading the manuscript itself? Um, so when I get into this, what I'm interested in doing is then um, thinking about what do these excavated manuscripts um, tell us about uh, historical uh, reconstructions? Um, how can we use this new data set uh, for linguistics? Um, and so basically, what I see here is an opportunity in that a lot of the historical reconstructions for Old Chinese in particular have been based on one specific text. Um, and all these texts that have been transmitted over time through the centuries that have been subjected to editorial and interventions. Um, but here we have this new massive new corpus of data that we can then test that against, right, and find problems. Um, so basically, that's what I want to do. I want to take sort of theories that have been developed from looking at the transmitted corpus, the received corpus, test it on excavated manuscripts. Um, and in particular, uh, I've picked in terms of the excavated manuscripts, scribal primers. Um, I do this for a number of reasons. Uh, primers, this is a site where learning to read and write first happened. Um, so it's part of education. It's part of a standardization process that was happening during the Han Dynasty. Um, it is also a fairly robust corpus. So here I'm looking at one particular text called the Sanjia Pian. Um, we now have it in, I believe, 18 different caches. You can see it from all across China, um, you know, East Coast, Northwest, into Central, and a little bit Southwest. Um, so we have a good geographic range. And what's really interesting, too, is that we can take these texts and we can use them to anchor language usage in a specific time and place, right? Um, we know maybe not in terms of the composition of the text itself, but in terms of one reception event. So we know that we can date this one manuscript to Gansu from the first century BCE, um, which is really helpful when we're testing these, especially how does language change over time and in place, right? Um, another aspect of this corpus that I think is really useful is that uh, these primers tend to be based on structural rhymes. Um, so the organizing logic behind what are ultimately just a list of random terms uh, isn't so much the content. There is sort of clustering of, of somatic relationships, um, but it's rhyming. Uh, so in particular with the Tajia Pian, each chapter will participate in a single rhyme scheme. You'll see that there's four character lines. There's a rhyme always after the second, yeah, every second line, right? Um, and so what this does is it takes away some of that guesswork of, is this a rhyming relationship or is it not? Um, this could be a problem. And as, when we get into the data, you can challenge me on this. But as sort of my base assumption, I'm going to prioritize these structural rhymes over you know, um, reconstructions. So what, uh, what I wanted to test in particular uh, in terms of picking just a random theory has been this theory of about old Chinese having a final R um, and that then changing into a final N or a final J. Uh, so this is uh, forwarded by Baxter and Sigart. Um, they are adopting uh, the theory from Starostin. Uh, basically, the, where this comes from is that there's been the observation that certain words have uh, both middle Chinese final N and final J readings, right? And so how does that happen? Uh, or certain characters have this. 
Um, we also see rhyme contacts in Old Chinese between characters that have middle Chinese pronunciations of N and J. So at some point, these split off in a different way. Um, and so the hypothesis is that, oh, well, way back in time in Old Chinese, they had a final R and then eventually they split off um, with the change from R to N being a mainstream change. And then the change from R to J being something that perhaps happened in a dialect. There's a, a idea that maybe this is the East Coast Shandong and that although that wasn't adopted into the mainstream, some of this survives into Middle Chinese. Okay. So now uh, another uh, apology in that uh, uh, this uh, talk isn't really sort of a polished paper. I don't have conclusions to give you really. I have some suggested conclusions, um, but really what I wanted to do is just go in a rough sort of chronological order from um, latest into older <laughs> primers. Now, I was going to show you the data and just give you a few thoughts about what the data is like and uh, actually really use this as more of a, as an actual workshop <laughs> and get your, your sort of help and your thoughts on it. Um, so the first uh, text that I was going to look at is called the Jijou Pian. Um, this is the only text of the bunch that has survived into the received corpus. Um, mainly actually through calligraphy. It was used as a, a calligraphy model from some very famous calligraphers like uh, Wang Shijir. Um, so we do have versions of this in our received corpus. We also have manuscript discoveries. Um, and so there's a few here. We have uh, a wooden prism that dates to uh, the Han period. We have another paper version, a paper manuscript witness um, that's slightly later. Um, because a lot of the, the rhyming that I'm gonna show you is uh, based on the received text. I'm treating it as late, late stuff, right? So it's potentially Han Dynasty, but there's potentially editorial interventions as well. Um, so here's uh, some of the data. Uh, basically, what I see when I see this is an inconclusive <laughs> uh, about what the status of R is in this text. Um, so what you see here in the highlighted in blue is uh, a rhyme series that has been proposed by Luo Chongpei and uh, Zhou Zumo. Um, the Jijiu Pan isn't as strict in its structural rhymes as the Sonic Jijiu Pan. So we see that there are um, you know, chapters that are wholly based on a single rhyme series, but it's not inevitably the case. Um, so there could be this, this sort of grouping could be wrong. But again, I'm going to start with that as my uh, sort of baseline. Um, it appears here that, well, there's two interpretations of the material that you can give. One is that R has already changed to N. And the reason I say that is because we have, um, towards the end, we have this Yuan, which has a definitive N in its old Chinese reconstruction. Um, and then we have uh, words like Tian. Um, see here yeah so uh yen and then we have chen here which has a, a definitive r in its old chinese reconstruction and these reconstructions by the way are those that are proposed by baxter and Sigart with some um fairly mechanical modifications to update some of the changes that happened during the han that have been proposed as, as ash pointed out earlier right um so one reading of all this is that okay we have you know r is rhyming with n here um and so therefore uh there must be a change uh, uh, sorry, da, 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 da. so it, it appears that R has changed the end. However, um, if you'll see here, there's a lot of sort of indefinite uh, uh, sort of pro propositions for the finals, right? So this may be N, it may not be, it may be N, it may not be, and so forth. Um, so if you look at uh, sort of where stuff is being clumped together, it's possible that there is a, uh, a smaller sort of subseries here where R is actually separated from N, and then that would suggest that R hasn't changed to N, right? So it's inconclusive. Um, just gonna point that out. So maybe like, you know, here there is a little bit of that going on. Um, there's other issues with this data set. So, like, I don't know why, you know, here we have Bien and there's the vowel E, whereas everything else has the main vowel of A. Um, but again, I'm, I'm prioritizing sort of the rhyme series over reconstructions, and so it's not going to bother me so much. 
Here's another series from the GGO pen. Uh, da, da, da. So this, this reflects it a little bit better in terms of what I'm saying about uh, subseries. So we have R, final R rhyming with final N. One way of interpreting all of this is that, okay, R has already changed the N, but here it's interesting that we have sort of three words that potentially have R um, kind of grouped together. And then we have the words with N being grouped together towards the end, right? So is there a divide here? Is these two, are these two different rhyming series versus one longer rhyming series? And I think if, you know, if it was one longer, if R had already changed the end, and this is indeed one long rhyming series, and you'd start to see R popping up in more isolated incidents, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is uh, first century BCE in terms of, so the traditional association is that this was composed by a fellow named Shurio in 40 BCE. However, I'm not treating it as late Western BC, uh, late Western Han, because we're using a transmitted version. So my, basically what I'm thinking about this is like, this is sort of said to be a Han text, but because we're using data that's passed through so many hands, there could be later interventions. And so um, and I think what really like excites me about the Han phonology project is that a lot of these attributions for supposedly Han texts are incorrect and late. Right, so like a lot of this poetry and these poetry productions are medieval. And what I want to be able to do is be able to go back and do exactly what you were doing before. And it's like, okay, let's guess where this comes from and be like, oh, this isn't actually a Han poem. This is a much later poem. Um, so I'm kind of treating this text in that frame that it, this is could be a Han text. We have an attribution, we have an idea, but we're not so sure. Um, there's a couple other things that really bother me about this series in particular. One is this, uh, this sure here. I have no idea why <laughs> that's in this series or what could be going on. Um, I give a whole long little bit of, of sort of hypothesis here that I, I don't think we really need to get into. Um, but also I find that in a lot of these series, we get uh, Ren, um, which I change here to a final N, but in the old Chinese is a voice velar nasal. Um, and you see a lot of voice velar nasals appearing in these series, and I don't know what's going on there and why that's the case. Um, and in fact, you can see that here as well. Um, yeah, so here's Ren again with Jun, so that that ing it's turned into in now with an R. Um, here we might have a smaller subseries. There's a definitive R, definitive R, and then an unknown. Could be an N, but it could be an R too. So is this an isolated sort of smaller rhyme within other rhymes that are going on, or is this all one long series? Yeah. It's, it's middle Chinese, or factors middle Chinese on the right. Yeah, sorry. So old Chinese on the left, the rhyme word, and then this is middle Chinese. Uh, in terms of Lehan. Yeah. So thank you for sending that. I just haven't had a time to put that, yeah, put that in. But oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For for Schusler, the Lehan, yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that. <laughs> um, and so another issue, speaking about, okay, are there smaller subseries of rhyming here? Is the vowels as well? Um, so we have a lot of schwa's, but then towards the end here, it starts to get into you know eyes, a lot of i as the main vowel. Vowel. So what's going on there? Um, in general, I've been basing a lot of this on just looking at the, the coda, the final, and not including the main vowel there, even though I know strictly speaking, it should be main vowel plus coda, but um, that does not seem to be the case often, even with my most strictly structured primers. Um, yeah. Sure, if there's anything I want to get into here. Okay, so let's turn next to uh, the Tanjie Pian. So the Tanjie Pian, um, there is an imagined attribution to it as well, going back to the Qin Dynasty. 
Uh, supposedly famous figures like Li Su and Zhao Gao had their hand in this. I think it's mostly hogwash. I think this is a story that was imagined in the late Western Han um, when they were ridiculing the Qin and they wanted to uh, uh, you know, paint these figures in, in a negative light. Um, the Tanjie Pian, as I mentioned before, each chapter has its own one rhyme series. It's every sort of eighth character or every two, four character lines. Um, what we have here, I'm not going to start with the base text of that, but what we have here is a manuscript that was discovered um, fairly recently in 2009 out in Gansu in Northwest mm -hmm. China. Um, it takes the base text of the Tsang Pian, and mm -hmm. then it adds at the very end of every line three characters that start up their own rhyme series, which still is the same rhyme series throughout every chapter, um, but it's a novel rhyme series, right? Um, and this dates to uh, the uh, late sort of first century BC, right? So this is our first sort of date and place anchor, late first century BCE. Um, and here we have sort of a new rhyming series. Um, and this is where we have our, our strongest sort of evidence of R um, sort of being retained in the text. Uh, so here we have uh, Yin, which is rhyming with uh, Jun, and then also Xi, and I'm obviously using sort of uh, modern pronunciations. Uh, but obviously, so we have Middle Chinese N, Middle Chinese ends with N, Middle Chinese ends with J, right? Um, so this would suggest to me that in this one manuscript for whoever compiled this commentary to the Sanjie Pian, they did not differentiate between N and J yet. It was R for these, these words. Um, and what's also interesting about this is that because it's a commentary, it doesn't seem to have been very widely distributed or popular. This is the only instance we have of this. My sense is that this is a very local composition. And so this might help us get at whatever's going on in the Northwest, right? Like this could be a, a vernacular in the dialect. Um, there is a problem, however, in that we have another series up here in the same manuscript um, where uh, there is the incorporation of Ren in what otherwise could be all ours. You know, so inconclusive, 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 all the way down. The only thing we have here is Jun, which is a definitive R. All of these could be final R, um, but then we have Ren. Right? And it seems pretty clear that this word could not have been the final R. So how do we explain that? Right? Um, and I'm not sure. I'm wondering if somehow it's anticipating the next rhyme, um, because the chapter after this then switches to um, voiced velar nasals. So maybe we have sort of you know the final word of this rhyming group is actually not part of the series, but then anticipates the next. And it's a memorization aid for, OK, now we need to move on to the next chapter. Um, but that's a problem that I don't know how to resolve yet. Okay, so now we're going on to the actual base text of the Sanjie Pian. Um, there's a number of witnesses to this. Uh, the one that I am going to pretty much solely use here uh, is a uh, what's called as the Village Teachers Edition of the text. And this one very strictly only does 60, 60 words, 60 characters per chapter. Um, and it's best seen on what's called the Han Board Manuscript. Unfortunately, this is not an archaeologically excavated manuscript. It was um, in a collector's uh, sort of in, in uh, yeah, a, a collection. Um, so we don't know in terms of time and uh, place anchors. It's not as uh, strong of evidence, but we do have the same edition, this village teacher's edition, in other witnesses that have been archaeologically excavated. Um, it tends to be somewhat later than the base text in Sanjay Pian. Um, from pre-village teachers editions, um, which I'm not going to get into here. Um, but again, I'm thinking this is more like uh, late or maybe let's just say first century BC. I think the maybe the most important point to highlight here is uh, this character Kun where we see in what is otherwise a, a series with final J, um, there could be uh, this word that has a tentative N. It seems here that uh, R 
if there was a final R in, in Old Chinese. By this point, for this linguistic community, um, this word had changed that final R to a J. All right. Um, so this is probably the most exciting bit of data that I've, I've encountered with these primers. Um, unfortunately, this is only attested on that one Han board manuscript. So that's the big caveat, the big um, asterisk. Um, if this turns out to be the case, though, if, if we can find and eventually get more data that shows that there was a change from R to J for the base text of the Sanjo pen, um, that'd be really super interesting and it actually get us into questions about, okay, where was the Sanjo pen composed? Um, and we can start to sort of speculate about, oh, from an author who has connections to the East Coast of China. Um, and that gets us back into this sort of imagined affiliation with Li Si and Zhao Gao and all these other figures. So there's a lot that I think could be done. I guess what I'm, I'm just trying to show how like these linguistic theories can then come and ch challenge these attributions um, and get us into sort of the, the social histories of these texts, which I think is really fascinating. Um, there is one, of, I don't know if you can really see the data that well, but there's this character here, right? Um, Chung, which again is this voiced velar nasal the, in, in this whole J series. Um, so this is another instance. I, I don't know why this is happening, but this just seems to be happening all the time with these primers. Um, here is a yeah yeah. The J, the J mixes with the a lot. Not so. This is one of the only times that I'm trying to think of if the other series are J series. Um, not as much as with the M series. There might be, I need to, we'll look at the, the there's one more set, the Weili Jodal type set. There may be an instance in there, but I don't think so. I think this might be the only time that it's in the J series. Um, but in other series where I think it, R is retained, it's still there, uh, even though those are then series that mainly seem to be words that change later to N. So. Here is another primer. Uh, this one uh, is a prism. So it's one of these like longer sticks of wood that have four sides. There's writing on each side of the wood. Um, it was discovered in 1979, also out in Gansu, so Northwest China. Um, it was found in the same uh, sort of cache or these sort of refuse piles that had Sanjie Pian in it. Um, and it has a lot of features that are similar to the Sanjie Pian in terms of it seems to be four words per line. Um, there's rhyming, it's 60 characters per, per chapter. Um, however, the rhyme structure seems to be very different. Uh, so here we have the first three lines that's rhyming after every fourth character, and then it switches up. And I'm not exactly sure how to read this yet. So it's not as strict in terms of the structural rhymes. Um, but I've highlighted in blue the ones that I think are, are should be rhyming. Um, and then I might want to include some of these as well, but I'm not so sure. Um, again, inconclusive evidence here. Um, R might have changed to N because we do, uh, it might have changed to N because we do have a definitive R rhyming with a definitive N, but it, it seems like the Rs are only found towards the end of the rhyme series. And so it's possible that maybe this is a different rhyme series than the ones above it, right? And if that's the case, then R has been specifically uh, sort of, um, yeah, uh, not changed to end. This is the last last group of primers. Um, they're called the Weili Jirdao sort of type of text. It's, you know, sort of the way of being an official. Um, these date mainly to the third century BCE. So this is getting towards the end of the Qin. Um, so not, this is before the Han phonology technically. <laughs> Um, and they've been found in uh, central China, Hubei. Um, these are our earliest finds. Uh, there are four witnesses that are extant, uh, one from Shui Fu Di. There's another one in the Yelu Academy collection. Um, we have another that was archaeologically excavated at Wangjia Tai, but has since deteriorated. There's been a lot of mold, and it's not going to get published, I don't think. Another one whose data we're waiting for that's in the Peking University collection. Um, what I did here, though, is I mostly just looked at the, I've compared the Shui Huti with the Yellow Academy um, data in my paper that I've drafted for this. Um, but right now, I think I'm just going to show the Shui Huti materials. Um, it's a much more complicated text. Uh, 
So it's not built around strict structural rhymes at all. Um, but there seems to be something close to it going on uh, with, uh, for instance, we have here like way um, and then E and Dre, like these seem to be something of a structural rhyme. I've color coded it over here, right? Um, that'd be those three. Uh, but there's a lot more sort of resonance that's going on in this passage. Uh, so based mainly on sort of the schwa as, a, as a, the vowel, right? So these are all main vowels, schwa, 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 all over the place. Um, and I, I, I guess the argument that I wanted to make with this is that if you look over this, it seems like it's read better if we assume that there's been a change from R to J, right? That just makes it more resonant. And if that's the case, that's um, really interesting because that suggests that there was a very early change of R to J. So what are, what are sort of the, my conclusions from looking at all these primer data? Uh, so Jijo Pian, it's possible that R has already changed to N based on the traditional division of rhyme series, um, but we can propose that there were further divisions within this longer series that retain a separation between R and N. Um, so inconclusive. Uh, with the commentary to the Sanjay Pian, uh, there is very strong, or at least very clear evidence of in one spot, um, uh, sort of, an R word that's rhyming with both an N final and J file and suggests to me that R has been preserved in that commentary. Um, and that's really interesting because uh, especially for this commentary, it could be a locally composed. And so that linguistic community retained R as a final. If we look at the Sanchez Pian base text, however, there's some suggestion uh, of an R or of a uh, possible N final in a J rhyme series, which might suggest then that R had been changed to J already for the base text by a linguistic community in an unknown location around the late first century BCE. Um, however, there is that conflict that I pointed out where we still have uh, a rhyme that incorporated Ren, uh, which the voice spelling may be rolling. So I'm not sure how to handle that. Um, Ma Jawan, no significant addition, um, but then with the Wei Li Jidao, it again, there seems to be a suggestion of an R to a J change that happened very early, so in third century BCE. Um, so that's basically what I've been thinking about and looking at. Um, there's lots of individual uh, issues that are in that data that I kind of put in that last column. So I'd love to talk about those at some point. And if anybody wants to look at the data, I'll send it to you and get your advice on it. Um, but my concern is mostly, you know, is there enough, am I working with enough data to actually say anything? It, it's still very limited. And I did that on purpose because I want to be able to anchor these things in time and place based on manuscripts. but then I'm sacrificing sort of the robustness of my corpus. Um, and again, this sort of perennial, uh, sort of this enduring problem of how do we assign rhyming in relationships? And I try to get around that by picking texts that have structural rhymes, but even with the primers, that's not always the case. Um, and yeah, this presence of voice spell or nasal in a lot of these series, especially the Ren and the Shui Chen, uh, Shui Chen's of manuscript is, is bothering me. So thank you for, for tolerating my, <laughs> my, my talk. And, yeah. Uh, the Sanchez Pian, so you said base text, and uh, so this is not a transmitted uh, text by spoken. Yeah. The only so the only transmitted text from all these is the Jijiao Pian. The Sanchez Pian, we have recompilations of this primer that were done in like late imperial period. And this is all the the, the fad, right? Um, and what those are based on are quotations of the Sanjay Pan that appear in other like reference works, right? So these Buddhist glossaries that I'm looking at, one of my, the reasons I got interested in them is because the Sanjay Pan is quoted all over in those. That data, however, is very different because it's, you know, the Sanjay Pan says that this word uh, means this or rhymes with this or is written that way. But then when we found these new excavated manuscripts that for various reasons we can, fairly confidently identified, this was the Sanjay Pen. Um, instead, it's just a, a listing of terms, you know, in these rhyming chapters, right? So clearly it's not, they aren't glosses in the Sanjay Pen is saying this term is that, or this term's written that way. So all of these quotations that are being compiled by these late imperial scholars seem to be later early medieval, medieval interventions of interpreting the text. Um, so it's useful data in a different way. So one of them is the base text, like uh, you said, okay, it's difficult to, from a critical point of view, reconstruct the genealogy, perhaps, something like this. 
Like, how do we know it's the base thing? Um, so really, there's only one manuscript where we see content that differs from all the other Sanjitian manuscripts, right? In a significant way. I mean, there's obviously there's individual variants here and there and whatnot. Um, and that's the straight trends of manuscript. And if you compare the straight trends of manuscript to these other witnesses that we have, we're discovering that. So if you look at one chapter in the so-called base text, it's a four character line. And then you compare it to the Strachenza, you have that same four character line. And then all of a sudden there's three insertions of new characters. And then it goes on to the next four character line that we see in the base text, right? So it's, it's mostly a comparison between the two that um, if we didn't have this Strachenza commentary, there wouldn't be any, like it would just be the subject of text, right? There wouldn't be a discussion of the base text or something the base text. Um, What's remarkable, so and I didn't talk about this like village, pre-village teachers versus village teachers edition, um, but there is remarkable stability across all of these manuscripts. When I talk about two different editions, it's not that there's much content change between them, it's really just how they've divvied chapters. Whereas the earlier ones tend to be much longer chapters, 120 words together, right? Whereas the village teachers inevitably, it's only 60, 60 words per chapter. Um, and I have a bunch of theories about that. I think it's related to um, studying and studying on these prisms that can only hold a limited number of characters per. And, yeah. So um, I sort of already had a question, but the thing you just said kind of makes it more urgent. Which is, so the, each chapter has one rhyme, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So then I guess on the one hand, if you have this 120 character like, oh, let's say, let me try and use the correct term. The pre village teacher, some of your can had 120 character chapters. Mm -hmm. And then the village teachers had only 60 character chapters. Mm -hmm. Like, does that mean that, that the village teachers is just half as long as text and they cut out the second half of each chapter? They have more chapters. Pardon? They have more chapters. So basically, you so take 120, you split it into two. Yeah. yeah, well, but it's it, it's a little bit more complicated than that because in the pre-village teachers editions, at least in some of the manuscripts we have that relate to that, um, it's not always in uh, intervals of 60 characters, right? You can have 150 or whatever. And so there is a problem in terms of, there was editorial intervention yeah. when the village teachers made the text where there is content loss or content change. So this, yeah. this idea of like a whole chapter having a, a rhyme character, which I guess in, in sorry, a rhyme category, mm -hmm. which I guess in, in the psychological literature is understood as is, 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 is like what text is that referring to? Village teachers? Well, it's kind of both, right? It's the same, it's the same content across both pre village and village. No, but that's impossible because I mean, like <laughs> if you have if you have 120 character yeah, yeah. chapter. Oh, so uh, so there are it's not there aren't unique rhymes for every chapter. One chapter participates in a single rhyme, but you in the village teacher you can have multiple chapters that all have the same sort of ending. So right? it's not like they're trying to work. No. All the rhymes. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do they have any theories about how this text was actually used? Like what steps they like? Did the kids memorize this thing and then write it out and play this chanted or something and then write it out the characters? So this is kind of what drew me to study this in the first place is that if you look at, how do I put this? So the text itself begins by saying, this is for uh, young children to memorize. And if they do, you can become a scribe. If you look at legal manuscripts on scribal training, while they don't mention this text by title, and I don't expect them to, because I don't think the title was on this text until after these scribal statutes were created. Um, but it seems clear that this is participating in that same corpus. Um, it's young adults, part of very, you know, it's an older, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a career tool, basically. It's not just, you know, I'm first learning to read and write and all these like little kitties are. And if you look at the content too of later chapters, especially, I mean, it's really, sophisticated, bizarre, archaic vocabulary. Like you wouldn't expect your six-year-old to be studying this. Um, and then if you look at like historical annals, um, you'll see parts where they're, you know, the, the historian is bragging about this emperor who, you know, could write 
the scribal treatises, right? And it's like, why would an emperor like write about it? Or you see a manuscript version of this buried with an aristocrat, um, this wealthy aristocrat. Like, why would you, you know, I wouldn't bury myself with Dr. Seuss necessarily. Like, um, so there's a lot of different contradictions going on in terms of like, how is this text actually being, who is it for? And my sort of conclusion is that it was for these scribal families it was used to test them and to make sure that they could enter into the bureaucracy, that they were equipped with literacy in a certain way, um, that these texts were very sort of strictly managed and controlled by those scribal families, but that during the late Western Han, it kind of gets out, right? Um, and I have a whole theory on this. It's sort of like the militarization of the Han frontier and he sends scribes out into the borders. They got nothing else to do. There's not strong controls. They start teaching it to you know, peasants and whatnot. Um, yeah, exactly. And so like a lot of what we see is from these military outposts in Dunhuang and, and it's, you know, shavings of repetitive copying and trying this. And it's usually the easier chapters, the chapters that have vocabulary that's simple to, to learn. Um, and that once that happens, all of a sudden the prestige of this text drops off. It's no longer used for testing. It's simplified, which is becomes the Jijio Pian. Um, you see a, there's a lot of overlap in the content and it's actually there's discussions in the historical treatises that say this was you know, sort of made off of the Sanjay Pian, but it's shorter and it's easier. Um, and that the, the more prestige text becomes these Confucian classics. So, and we have like 18 different uh, caches that include the Sanjay Pian now. The very first discovery of it was by Arl Stein in the early 20th century. And it wasn't, it was identified shortly after that um, by Wang Bo Wei, uh, Wang Bo Wei, uh, Luo Zhenyu. Um, they sort of hypothesized that it was the Sanjie Pian, and it, because there is this opening to the text, it's Sanjie Zuo Shu Yi Jiao Bo Su, right? And so there's a, a convention in early China where texts are often titled after their initial characters or characters in the first sentence, right? So that's sort of the idea popped in. Um, a lot of these, so there's another sort of lots of discoveries in the 30s in the Northwest with Zhu Yan. Um, fragments of this text seem to appear in there. Um, but really sort of like the, the big moment was in the, oh gosh, it's like 1970s, Guiyang, Shuangu Dui, yeah, 70s. Yeah, 77, right? Um, and that was the first time when we got one of these manuscripts in a tomb that was a, a grave good. Um, it's very fragmentary, but it was it's sort of a longer version and we can start to piece out the content a bit more. 